also going to say, um, hold your questions, please, and uh, give a space for questions before we move on beyond this. But um, especially because of the recording piece, that, that is even more appropriate now. So write down questions, remember questions. Uh, let's go through this presentation piece. So <clears throat> I want to start with a couple of caveats. And one is I consider myself to be a citizen economist. and you certainly don't have any college education on economies or economics or anything like that. But I do pay attention. I do have lots of questions and I do um, come across lots of information and try to put that together. And the other caveat is I'm happy to have a, a side discussion, a sidebar discussion with anyone about any of the facts I throw out or any of the conclusions I draw from those facts. Um, but for purposes of what we want to do today, um, let's not get caught up in arguments. Let's just treat this as a trying to level the playing field and, and present some information for everyone so that the discussion that follows uh, will be coherent. I also, before we get into the economics piece, I want to talk a little bit about the fourth turning. So there was a book called The Fourth Turning written uh, many years ago. And without going into a lot of detail, it says that every culture goes through about an 80 year cycle. And the culture that we're in right now, our cycle started in 1945 with the end of, of World War II. And these cycles, 80 years long, tend to go through four phases. Each phase is a generation, about 20 years. And so if you think of 1945 to 1965, that was really the start of a whole new economy, a whole new culture. Coming out of the war, so much of the world was devastated. Um, and the US built its economy in those first 20 years. A lot of the culture was established then. And then the second 20 years is the peak of the culture. So you think 1965 to 1985, that was really the peak of the culture uh, and also the peak of the economy in, in many senses of the word. And then the third turning, the third generation, the third 20 years, 1985 to 2005, is when the problems start to show up. Now it's not all sweetness and light. Now it's not all picket fences. Now we start to see there's issues here. Assumptions have been made and these assumptions are about to bite us in the butt. And then the, the last 20 years, the fourth turning, 2005 to 2025, is when it all comes crashing down around us. And then that leads to the next first turning, the start of a new cycle. And so I just kind of want to put us in there because not everybody agrees with this with this with this theory. Um, but for me, it gives us a lot of framework within which to work that we are coming to the end of a cycle and there's going to be a lot of destruction, economic or otherwise, um, to clear the field to start something new. Another piece of history. So 1960 if you were in the top tax bracket, you made the most amount of money in the year, 1960, of, of anyone in the country, your tax rate, your tax bracket was 91%. Income tax rate was 91%. Now that left you plenty of money to be comfortable, plenty of money to build up assets, but it wasn't excessive. <clears throat> by 10 years later, by the end of 1969, the rate had come down to 72%. So think about that for a minute. The richest people in the US were taxed at either 91 to 72% on their income during the greatest economic advance in, in, in that this country has ever seen. So it really doesn't correlate, or correlate well with all this, we can't tax the, the rich because then they won't create jobs and we're all suffering for that. It was a complete opposite. Stuff had to be paid for and the rich were paying for it. They were still comfortable. They weren't losing out a lot. Um, but people tend to forget this fact that they were being very heavily taxed at that point. I also want to point out before we get too deep into this that corporations don't pay tax. Even today when corporations file a tax return and send money to the government, and by the way, 26 of the 50 largest companies in the US in 2017 either paid no tax or got a refund. 26 of the 50 largest companies. So, but my point is 
corporations won't pay a tax because if they know they're going to pay a tax on the income, the net income after they sell the product, they're going to build that into the budget and, and they're going to charge for it. The customer, the consumer is going to pay the tax. And so if we want to lower consumption, raising prices of goods would be one way to help lower consumption. And I think for in terms of the climate and stuff, we'd like to stop using as much plastic as we do today and driving as much as we do today. So letting the consumer pay the tax might help with that. I'm only gonna mention this um, next piece for you to go off and explore. I'm not gonna get into details of it, but there is a, a lot of people think there's no alternative to this economy. Our current US dollar monetary system is the eighth monetary system the US has had. And so we have had lots of other ways to do money. And there are voices today that say we're thinking of income tax in, in a poor way. We're not, we're not really understanding how money works. And I'll point to modern monetary theory is what this goes by, MMT. There's lots of pro MMT and lots of con MMT theories, other uh, conversations out there. If you're interested, that would be something to dig into. But at the bottom, bottom line of all this about money, money is created from debt. So we, our banking system operates under what's called a fractional reserve system. And if you go to Bank of America and you ask for a mortgage loan to buy a house and you ask for, let's pull a number out of the air, 500,000, Bank of America doesn't have 500,000 sitting in a vault somewhere that they then hand over to you. They have to have somewhere between two and 9% of that 500,000 as some kind of asset. And what they count as assets are the loans that they give out become an asset to them because you promise to pay them back. And so if they loan you that 500,000 because they have 50,000 in reserves, that 500,000 promise to repay now becomes their asset. They can lend out 5 million. Okay, so money multiplies, money is debt. There's a problem with this. And the problem with this is when Bank of America loans you that 500,000, they also didn't, that debt did not create the money needed for you to pay back that debt with interest. The money for the interest is not being created at the same time. And so one way to look at this is this creates a very competitive situation where each borrower has to fight to get the money they need to pay not only the debt, but also the interest. And that cuts someone else out of the ability to, to have money to pay back their debt. Or it creates a Ponzi scheme where new debt is always required in order to keep new money created into the system so that the old existing debts can have the interest to pay them to pay the debt back. It also throws in an interesting corollary, which is if you default on your debt or if you completely pay off your debt, money is destroyed. And so banks don't want you to do that. The government doesn't want you to do that. They don't want you to default and they don't want you to pay back because that destroys money. And then they have to go find more borrowers. Now think of this again in the historical model. In the 1960s, one income, 40 hours a week, was enough to pay for education, vacations, medical care, save a little bit for retirement, put a kid through college. One income could do that. As the money system expanded in order to support consumption, they needed more debt to create more money because that's where money comes from is debt. And so we get into credit cards, we get into two incomes required or more. We get into, eventually, we get into student loan debt. The interesting thing about student loan debt is, if you go back 30 years, 30 years ago, um, if a student was gonna go to college and, and needed to pay for tuition, it was up to the parents to fund that tuition, to fund that education expense. And they were already burdened with mortgage interest payments, with car payments, with credit card payments. And so there was very little room left for them to borrow money to put their kid through college. When colleges switched over and banks switched over to a model of letting the student borrow based on a fantasy about what their income is going to be after they get their degree, that opened up a whole new vista of lending, which creates a whole big pile of money. And what did we see happen with colleges? Tuition skyrocketed. 
okay? And it didn't go to the professors because now most schools don't have a tenure track. Most schools are using associate professors and PhD candidates teaching the classes at $22 an hour when they're actually collecting a lot more than that in from tuition and stuff. So now it's just turned into profit. So here again, this is how we're creating inequalities and, and not moving forward very well. So now let's get into the bailout because the bailout that just got passed by Congress, the 2.2 trillion we keep hearing about, um, here again, that's just money coming out of thin air. When the Federal Reserve creates money for a bailout, there is no reserves behind that. They're just making it up. They're just adding digits to a computer. And so do we really want bailouts going to, to save a cruise line, to keep a cruise ship going? Do we really want to go into hedge funds because they're not being able to fund their mergers and acquisitions and their takeovers and and gutting pension funds for, for long-term or companies that have been around for a long time? That's not really generating any real services or goods for the consumers. And it's just a way to put money in, in a few people's pockets as opposed to everyone else. When you also tie to that a requirement that you have a tax return file in order to get the money, this cuts out a lot of people because there are a lot of people who don't make enough money to be required to file a tax return. And so the money goes to a certain swath of people but certainly not to everyone who might, uh, who might require it. We also see this bit about unemployment. So I was listening to a, um, a radio talk show this morning and what was being, the phrase being used was to nationalize the payroll. So there is a bit of small business relief, although it's hard to see how this is gonna actually play out over the next couple of weeks. Getting money from the government is never quick nor easy, so we're gonna see how this works out. But nationalizing the payroll is, is, is a way to just say the government is going to make all the payroll payments, okay? Nobody gets laid off. Nobody's unemployed. They don't have to go to work because the government is telling them stay home. They do what the government tells them, and that makes the government responsible for their pay. And <clears throat> hopefully it'll be just a couple of months and not be terribly uh, expensive. But the government prints money out of thin air anyway. So you might as well do it. And if because they have not yet enacted mortgage relief or rent relief so that people are still on the hook for paying all this stuff, there's also no talk about credit card payment relief. That means there's going to be a lot of credit defaults, a lot of people not paying their, not able to pay their mortgage, a lot of people not able to pay their credit cards. And remember what I said, that destroys money. So on the one hand, we're going to have all these defaults and foreclosures that destroy money. And on the other hand, we've got the governments to kind of print money out of thin air to compensate, to keep money flowing in the system. So you might as well print the money out of thin air and give it to the workers that need help with their rent rather than giving it to the cruise lines. Okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to present about the bailout. And so all this talk about debt leads me to something that I think is very, needs to be talked about a lot, and that is a jubilee. Now, if you look back in history, there's often been debt jubilees, and a debt jubilee means all debt is forgiven. Everybody starts back at zero. Where this typically would happen would be, you have a king over his nation, and he would print money, and then the king would die, and a new king would come in. Well, the new king would not pick up the old king's money, and the new king would create his own money, and that new money was not sufficient or was not accepted to pay off the old debts because they were in the old currency, and so it was natural to have a debt jubilee. So the economy would reset every so many years, every dec every few decades, the economy would reset. We haven't done that in this country for a hundred years, and so debts are piling up. We know this. We see this at the state, local, and federal government level. We see this at, with individuals. We see it with corporations. A debt jubilee would be a way to reset the economy and say, okay, we've got a gap of three months here where so many people were not working, not taking in money. We're just going to start from scratch, and that may look like a new currency. It may look like a debt jubilee. All kinds of things come up with that, and so that's this is going to be one of our questions in the breakout group is what are your concerns and what are your dreams about a debt jubilee? 
And so we'll spend some time digging into that as, as small groups. And then the last piece. So what does less inequality look like? So we have experienced over last, over my lifetime, we've experienced a widening gap between the rich and the poor. And for a long time, I've said that can't go on forever. This is unsustainable. At some point, that gap will start to narrow. What does that look like? What will it take? What will be the trigger? And how will we react? So here we are at a time when that gap is going to suddenly become huge overnight because of so many people not being able to work. And so what does it look like to start to bring that together? <clears throat> the last thing I'm going to say about this is I always like to refer back to Winona LaDuke. Winona was talking about her native, her, her tribe and, <clears throat> and how her, her tribe evolved and, and was making its way through life without money before the colonists. And she said, you know, we knew where the, when the berries were going to be ripe and where. We knew when we could fish for salmon. We knew when we could take the deer because the, the, uh, doe, the fawns had been born and, and were now able to survive on their own. We, <clears throat> we knew we couldn't take them while the mother was pregnant. We knew all these things, where the nuts were and, and all of this stuff. And then the settlers come in and say, you have to stay on this one acre. This is your acre, but you can't take anything from anybody else's acre. Well, she says, my acre didn't have salmon. It didn't have nuts. It didn't have berries. It didn't have deer. How am I supposed to live? So I think land reform is something that it really needs to start to be processed here. How do we do this? In Thailand, the king owns 90% of the country. Where my wife and I have our house, we say we own the land. All we have is, a, is the remaining portion of a 99 year lease from the king. And at the end of that 99 year lease, it has to be renegotiated. And so if you're buying a property that only has 10 years left, of course, you're gonna pay less for that property because you know you're gonna to have to renegotiate in a few more years. If it's got a long lease, you pay more. So there are ways to do this where people don't actually own the land, they're just renting the land. And I think that's a big piece of what we need to, to process here too in terms of wealth inequality becoming smaller. So with that, um, yeah, go ahead. Michelle, take it off. Very good. Oops, it's recording again. I think I need I need to tell you all, I need to leave in one minute. Yeah. Okay. And I have 10 questions and a few references. <laughs> so if I have the time and discipline, I'll try to write them out and share them for use another time. That was just wonderful, or, wonderful Derek. Or connect with me, Nancy, and, and we can do this off. That would be lovely too. I'm actually going to get into a conversation that my son has set up on a Zoom call with some of the people in this circle who are not here right now, because as I've mentioned, he's actually partway through a doctoral program mm -hmm. in economics and his advisor is the person with others who set up the MMT. So it's oh. been a central, central part of their work. So hmm. another conversation for another time, y'all. This was great. I'm sorry to have to leave. I'd love to hear the discussion. If you're willing to record the discussion, or at least the Q&A right now. Sure. I'd love to listen to it later, but yeah. I'll say goodbye now. We're gonna do the discussion in breakout groups and we can't record breakout Got groups. Got that, sure. understood. Okay. okay, thank you, bye-bye. Thank you so much, be well. And Kendon, I saw you check in there in the middle of my uh, no questions please segment. So would you like to check in with us? Good day, everyone. I got lost in the maze of the internet. Yeah. Don't blame it on Eventbrite because then you're like everybody else. Mm. I just hey, Garrett, yeah, Leoma wants to jump in here. Let's hear yeah. from Leoma yeah. what she's trying to say. leave for the same call that Nancy is leaving for. Oh, okay. I can say that this topic absolutely fascinates me. Yeah. So I hope mm. we can work with it more on another day because right. it's, it's just yeah. I really appreciate it. So Thank you, Leoma. Let's do more. And, off I go to Eric's call. Okay, be well, be well. All right, see you later. Okay, so 
I think we can open it up for a few minutes of con our questions before we break out, but I'd really like to get us into groups and, and let you all start okay. to have some conversation about this. So anybody have a real burning question before we go into into small groups? Okay, let's sort it out in the, oh, Francesca. I just wanted to say our numbers are shrinking. Um, I can't imagine there's too many small groups that can be put together. Yeah. I just, I just wanted to raise um, the question whether yeah, it's so possible to keep it all together. Well, it's, they were only planning on doing it for a couple of minutes. And it's basically just to test the technology, I think, and make sure, just like proof of concept. They've never done it before and they want to see how it works. Oh, okay. And, and would it work yeah. for four per group? Because once we do the breakout, I will join one group and Michelle will join one group. So there'll be four in a group and maybe well, we won't do it. We can, we can make three rooms and then there will be two or three in each, or I could just make two. Just make two rooms. Yeah. Okay. And you'll yeah. join one, I'll join one. And All right. that'll be four per group. And, um, with that in mind, let's call it 25 minutes. And um, um, uh, at the end of 25 minutes, that'll give us time to, to uh, brief out. Does it? And no. I don't think so. Okay, I 20. Think that's too long. 20. Yeah. Can we, yeah, can we go to 20? Can we? Um, okay, okay I, 15. I'm not, I'm, 15. 15 sounds. Uh, Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think 15 yeah. is going to be. I think Less 15 is, is, is going to be the most we'll want okay. to do, so we have time okay. to, to to recap. Okay. Recap after. So, as we are getting ready and not breaking out yet, but as we are getting ready to break out, I want to share a screen here, and these are the two questions that I propose we talk about uh, in our in our breakout rooms. And so, as I mentioned during my talk, what are your concerns or dreams about a 2020 Jubilee year? And then the second one, who are you most concerned about being left behind during this next year? That's like April 1 to March 31. And how might we include them in our solutions? So Can you copy really speaks... that into the chat? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Can you absolutely do that, yep. Um, and so one one more time here any questions before we go into our breakout rooms i'm trying to get to the if you stop sharing your screen it'll be easier to find it again oh thank you yeah Mm -hmm. So I would just note that that um, debt forgiveness, uh, uh -huh. when it's mortgages for single homeowners, and it's uh, consumer credit forgiveness and student loan forgiveness, mm -hmm. all the categories of forgiveness that. Uh, debt forgiveness that apply to ordinary people are benign, but corporate borrowing has been a, a really huge portion of it for the purpose of adding to the share buybacks uh, that corporations are now squandering over the last decade, 53% of their profits on. Mm -hmm. um, so it would be like rewarding uh, the worst behavior. Uh, in terms of hoarding and siphoning profit uh, in the top 10% of the income distribution who own 84% of all stock value and exclusively benefit from all those share buybacks. If you have a retirement account with stock in it, you're not positioned to benefit from them. So, you know, there's an economist, William Lazenick, everyone should read, who really describes we have a pathological economy. His phrase for it is predatory value extraction. And so the thing we have to be really careful about is that we are not facilitating and rewarding predatory value extraction. And so I, I would Absolutely. contemplate that forgiveness globally. Mm -hmm. 
it would have to be specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I, I am on board with that. And clearly there's a lot of details in, in the devil. And so we would really have to, you know, it would take a lot of discussion to pull it off. And that's what makes me fearful is that it would take so much discussion to pull it off. We'd never do it. Um, but I think at some point the credit world might be in such disarray because of three months forced unemployment um, for so many millions. I mean, we're talking tens of millions uh, of people that aren't going to be paid for the next three months. And that's going to cause so much disruption. Something's going to have to be done. I just want to make sure we're looking after the little folk instead of the big folk. Right. I agree. Yeah. So, okay. Um, with that being said, can we break out we into the rooms? Okay. The rooms. Here we go. And you've been invited, just uh, click to accept that you're joining the room. Uh, who's, who's doing which? Uh, Michelle, is it? Hmm? Uh, just, you there? should have a, a something that pops up that says, um, that gives you the option to join a room and I then i'm just asking which one you're going to be in um i don't know yet it depends on how how the rest of them fall out i'm they're just assigned randomly for this this is the current attempt okay i uh, i had a prompt to uh, join the breakout room which i went to and then it it was just me and it was silent, so I've come back to the main screen. Okay, um, go into that because it's just that, that uh, the other people have not joined your room yet. Okay. I'm trying not to take it personally. Yeah. And okay. now Peter has, so, and actually that's the less populous room, so I'm going to join that room. Hello. Hi. Uh, hey there. Howdy, howdy. I and feel I all broken up. Derek is assigned to join this room also, but um, as the host, it may be confusing for him. So hopefully he will figure it out. Um, so one question I had, oh, sorry, I need to do some management here. Um, yeah, lo logistic question. Can you see if I'm, if, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. See you. Good. All right. There we go. Oh, good, good, good. They'll let anybody in this group. They will. <laughs> um, okay, sure. I was kind of thinking, Michelle, you and I would split, so one of us would be in. Uh, yeah, it's um, when it auto assigned, somehow it assigned four to the first group and two to the second group. That was leaving you and me out. And so then yeah. we would normally join. We have the option. We would stay in the big room. We would then join a room if we wanted to. So we right. didn't have to be assigned. Right. Okay. But four and two. Four and two. Okay. But it but it uh, it defaulted to four and two instead of three so, and three. Sorry, for Peter the... and Bob, to take all this time. But there's a way to, even okay. the, when that screen pops up and shows you what it's going to do, you can move people around. Okay. Before, before you click a uh, break up. B before so, you send before people you into send the rooms. It. Okay. Yeah. You can move it. And that way you can also swap people, exchange. Oh, I don't want that person with that person. Let's move this around. So, okay. We'll work on that. Great. Right. I'm in fourth Working grade out the bugs. again. All right. Working out the bug. <laughs> yeah. You're part of the beta test. And no, we're not testing the vaccine on you. <laughs> Yet. Yet. <laughs> hmm. So questions um do, is there a particular one you want to start with is there something you want to ask that's not even on the list well i, I wanted to mention that paul and i actually for years have talked about uh, it, almost in a humorous way except it's not funny is that uh, the, our culture is simply based on people owing money which is i think what you that's kind of an oversimplified way maybe to talk about what you're you were saying uh, how we mm -hmm. manufacture money. It depends on people being in debt and owing. And it's gotten, you know, the, um, it's just gotten tighter and tighter and tighter to the well past the point of absurdity a number of years back. Mm -hmm. So um, this has been something I think some of us must have been thinking about for a very long time. 
Uh, and you mentioned yeah. land reform, and you know, it's uh, I've thought that too because uh, it the other the discussion I think that is a part of this is a limit on wealth, and again, all these things are like the third rail. They're all touch them and you'll get electrocuted. Nobody's going to listen <laughs> to you in an argument. Right. And that's that's an intentional strategy, of course, really by both major parties, but certainly by one, particularly. I don't want to get into all that. Well, uh, I think no politician would have the ability to bring this up in a campaign and get elected. Yeah. yeah. You know? So I, I don't even try to point fingers at yeah. either war party. It's yeah. like, no, you can't even, it, this is going to take a real grassroots movement to say, you know, we're not going to abide yeah. by anything less than this. Um, but you will have, it's a huge education piece because even people all for justice and equity, but don't you dare take my house. Right. You know, right. I yeah. mean, people have a lot invested, a lot of sunk costs yeah. and a lot yeah. of, uh, I followed all the rules and now you're telling me you're taking it away anyway. You know, there's going to be some of those discussions too. Yeah. So it's a huge piece. It really yeah. takes a, a massive reset to, to even have this conversation. And I suspect more than what this uh, illness, this disease and these quarantines are providing us with, but it's certainly, I think it'll be the start of people thinking about it, which is probably I, I certainly helpful think at this point. What it would take if this isn't enough. Well, <laughs> look, I, I mean, <laughs> I remember in the late 60s and the 70s, I would know people would say, I can't wait for the revolution. I'm, I, I, this whole thing is going to fall down. It's all going to go. And I kept thinking, well, and what do you think is going to be there instead? <laughs> you, know, mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, I knew like a couple of people who, hippies who were out living off of the land. I thought, is that, we're going to just all decide we're going to do that? And mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of it sounds perfectly reasonable in one sense, but uh, we're used to an infrastructure. Right. And how do we decompress and create local, mm -hmm. local economies and stuff? Mm -hmm. That's a, so that's all part of the discussion, I assume. For, right. And Peter and Michelle, you've been quiet. What's up with you two? After you. Okay. Um, so uh, one of one of the things that when I hear about you know the jubilee, um, my first thought is more. Uh, international debt relief and um, correcting some of the crimes of colonialism mm -hmm. uh, by uh, eliminating foreign debt for uh, post-colonial countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Especially, you know, having worked in Congo, which was, it was the model on which the term kleptocracy was based. Uh, you know, yeah. Mobutu just siphoned off yeah. every dime yeah. that came into the country. Wow. Um, and, and it was vicious. And it's, you know, then there's millions of people who live there who had nothing to do with that. They finally had a bloody civil war followed by another, followed by another, followed by, I think, a fourth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, those people have nothing to do with it. The country still owes the debt. And, yeah. um, and so, and I don't know how that, that correction and mm -hmm. at that level of, of international finance, what that would mean if we eliminated all of that debt, um, what are the, what are the ripple effects in the, you know, obviously it's like these big international banks, uh, including World Bank and IMF. Uh, and and I want to say collapse. Two One is which collapse? Which would yeah. that be entirely a bad thing? It depends on what what they what what, you know, what makes them entitled to it. It was money out of thin air, first exactly. Of all. Yeah. So why yeah. what makes them entitled? The second thing but, I want to uh, say is, but what would the repercussions be? Is more right. like, but most of U.S. foreign aid can't speak for other countries, but most of U.S. foreign aid is money that the government prints and it gives to the. Halliburton or the Boeing right. or the Lockheed Martin Staking. to yeah. make something and then it yeah. ships this over to the other country and makes them pay for it. Right. And so it might be a hydroelectric dam. But mm. if it's the only dam in the country, they don't have an engineering school that teaches people how to maintain that dam. 
and they don't have the infrastructure to manufacture the parts they need and maintain it, it works for 60 days and then it, the part breaks and, oh, yeah. and they're paying for it for the next 50 years, money out of thin air, who's entitled to, the, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a huge mess. Yeah. <laughs> Peter. Happy to hear you guys talk about it and just why don't you continue, I don't have really anything particular to add. Okay, well, we've got four more minutes. So can we touch um, briefly on the last question, which is uh, who's going to be left behind in all this and, and what can we do about not leaving them behind? Well, we all know who's going to be left behind, don't we? <laughs> it's the same people who are always left behind. They're always it's left the, behind. The poorest, the least able people in minority communities. We, I remember the uh, the presentation with the, the, the women who came up from uh, uh, Hunting, not Huntington Beach, it's the LA area where they, it's, it's a typical area. We have it up in the Bay Area around Pinole and all that where you have refineries right in people's backyard. You just turn, <clears throat> if you made a deal with uh, people in Bel Air and Beverly Hills, I'm sorry, we're gonna have to move those to your place. So we'd probably get some real political movement on that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but of course that's not gonna happen. That's mm -hmm. still, again, as I say, everywhere I look, it's dollars in real estate. Uh, for all the other phony investments and stuff, uh, mm -hmm. people can't just create land on their own. So, well, and it's the people that had to work in New York City the night Sandy came on shore and faced yeah. all the flooding and stuff because mm -hmm. their minimum wage, they, if they miss a night yeah. of work, they get fired, they didn't yeah. have a choice, the restaurant yeah. was kept open to make money yeah. in the middle of a landfall of a hurricane. Yeah. Hello, Let's, yeah. there's nothing yeah. wrong with that idea, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, oh my God, a... you know? So, yeah, those are the people that get left behind in this. Yeah. I mean, really, seriously. So. I think <laughs> that was um, helpful. <laughs> I think the the question is including them in solutions and mm -hmm. um you know part of it would be to step up the level of democracy and facilitating participation um, so that they get support to participate in decision-making processes. Right. Um, then, yeah, then um, I think another, another piece of it of, of how to include them in solutions, you know, so, so it is one of these situations of, um, know about us without us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because they're still struggling they don't have time to have this discussion be right this discussion. right and, and, in order to, to eat. and in order for them yep. to be participants they <clears throat> need to be financially supported mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. participation time and that just that in itself could resolve a lot you know paying mm -hmm. people like we pay juries to participate mm -hmm. in things like citizen mm -hmm. assemblies huh uh, um, please like be that. prepared. Ideally, better up. than we pay juries, but more than fifteen dollars a day. You say. Yeah, oh, it's okay. funny about that. All um, right, I think if I click the close rooms, it'll give a on. little countdown timer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There we go. Um, please be prepared to share that piece, Michelle, when we come back together with the group <clears throat> sure. about you know and maybe figuring a way to include people so we don't talk about them without them being in the room. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to pop back into other, the main room. Other things, other thoughts. Okay. I guess we'll see you there. We're coming back in. Um, hey, it's the same room. What do you know? It's because we bailed early. And now the and oh, now yeah. the question yeah. is yeah. yeah oh yeah their their breakout room won't close for another thirty five seconds is the the note that I'm seeing in the breakout room window mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. um here we go okay back Pulling back in we got Welcome. one more Francesca yeah I don't know what happened she was in our small group yeah. 
Well, uh, she'll, she'll be back in 12 seconds regardless because it'll close her out. So <laughs> if she hasn't found the window or can't, can't. Uh, well, we, um, um, what to actually, do with we, it. we were all, we all just got into the back here when it, when it booted us. Oh, there we go. There she is. Okay. There she is. okay. So how was that? I mean, I, 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 I liked getting into small group actually and having a discussion in that way. I, I think, I think it, was, it was really nice and it did really personalize it and it did feel like the right time to share um, all of these thoughts. Um, so I thought it, actually, I thought it worked well. Good. I was in a group with Paul, Kendon, and Francesca. Mm -hmm. And Michelle and I were discussing there are ways we could have adjusted that so that I was in one room and she was in the other yeah. as host. But um, yeah, so we're learning. Next we're time. <laughs> playing with the technology. Somebody else, how, how was that for you? I, I think it worked great, actually. I mean, I didn't, I, I actually realized it could have been longer to really get them into a flow where we have mm -hmm. uh, a collection of thoughts that have some cohesion. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I like I like how it works. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to share about the process? And then we'll dig into maybe some gleanings from that. Okay. So what came out of your discussion? Yes, Lionel, go ahead. You know, my biggest thing that I'm reminded of right now, um, it's like a principle that like just has come back to me like repeatedly, 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 repeatedly in my life. Um, it's, way more helpful to start conversations by talking about goals and mm -hmm. actually getting agreement on goals um, first and then like let strategies come later and um, and just as like a personal somewhat personal but I think I are kind of would argue for it um, it's great to have a good like a solid agreed on set of goals because then we can have a process for a for like collecting and evaluating ideas and I possibly, you know, like having research happen at universities about possible efficacy of different ideas. And then we can test out ideas in different, you know, pilot projects and then roll out ideas to like, you know, regional, state, national scale after they've been like, if their efficacy has been established in like a smaller area and then mm -hmm. rolled out from there. And so, there's something, yeah, I don't know. I just like, I'm just reminded through this conversation that we're talking about huge things, starting with goals is like the most important. Mm -hmm. And then like, and then like testing our assumptions is like the next most important thing. Thank you for that. Yeah. So that was process. Anyone want to share content that came out of your small group? I asked Michelle to share something out of ours. Yeah. I can. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh. So, um, so, in addition to the points I made while we were all in the group, the main thing I had to say was that um, there are sort of proposals out there that are hugely <laughs> popular with voters, a uh, clear majority of the voters in the country not just the majority of voters in the Democratic Party. Uh, Medicare for all wins in exit polls in every state that it's done exit polls uh, to tell the primary. Uh, so the Green New Deal is the most popular policy item introduced, um, I don't know, any time in the last decade. Um, and so I, I really wanted to focus on uh, the need to make our stimulus response, our response to people having no income or work, uh, a response that makes use of human energy and time, the very finite waking hours of mortal human beings should be dedicated uh, in the service of life and life's most urgent challenge domestically, right, is that we have to stop uh, being the highest per capita emitters on earth. Mm -hmm. um, so that will help the lowest uh, per capita emitters on earth stay alive. 
Um, so that's really urgent. Uh, so that, that was sort of my thought. The, my only thought on your presentation, I actually expressed to the police. Mm -hmm. I suppose one way of putting my content thought is um, that I would be focused on the Senate majority in 2020, if that's not too condensed a statement. Not at all. I'm right there with you, Kendon, thinking about that. Uh -huh. So uh, kind of to, to follow on what Paul had said, uh, what I had talked about in our group was um, when we start to say, how do we make sure that the solutions don't leave people behind? Um, and the, the thing that popped immediately into my head is this, this phrase, you know, nothing about us without us. Well, how do we facilitate those who are likely to be left behind being part of the conversation? And the image that came to me is um, doing something along the lines of grand juries and citizen assemblies where people like it for jury service get paid, but ideally, you know, get paid something a little bit closer to a living wage to spend time in public participation mm -hmm. um, to really make that active and make that accessible to people who usually uh, couldn't do it. They don't have the bandwidth, they're working three jobs or living on the streets or whatever, um, and to really make it something that, that financially benefits their lives and fully facilitates their participation. Anybody else have something they want to add? Well, we were talking about <clears throat> your comment on land reform, okay. and I was just saying that <clears throat> There's a series of things, progressive taxing, uh, land reform. Actually, I was, gonna, I was saying they've been made into a third rail politically. The truth is we have, of course, we have no discussion in America about land reform uh, because I think from what we understand of our own politics, it's almost too outrageous to mention. On, it, on, it's a very vast, on a very vast scale, it's the, it's the NIMBY issue about how we, um, uh, how can we have people have some enthusiasm for, I, I, I don't know if I said it in the group, but my, my thought is sort of that the, there's a lot of things we can let go of. And it would at some point be, I think, a comfort to people. But I do see a lot of difficulty with money and real estate. I mean, that was my main comment that I, when we were discussing it, mm -hmm. uh, that that's a huge, huge roadblock to everything. And we did discuss about this particular situation with the coronavirus and people, because of the income issues and everything else, that this might be, might be a place where a lot of these ideas can get a good test run mm -hmm. to, to be discussed. Um, and it, as Michelle said, uh, know about us without us is very much to the point of exactly this. That's, uh, uh, Derek asks who's who's likely to be left behind, and I think we all kind of had the same thought, you know. So it's the same people who are always left behind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the content uh, things I, that came up for me is in um, in debt forgiveness. Um, those who have been unable to take out debt. Uh, in a jubilee are hurt relative to those who have um, and and that's that's something that has to be addressed Absolutely. in that in that imagined future and one of the proposals that's been floated for quite a while now not necessarily about forgive all debt but maybe about um, give people fifty thousand with the caveat that if you have fifty thousand in debt it has to go pay off the debt and if you don't have 50000 in debt, you get to keep it and spend it however you want. And so that would address both ends of the spectrum. The people who are so rich, they don't have debt, they get 50000 that's nothing. And the people that don't have any debt because they don't have any money, and now they got 50000 There you go. That's, that's, that's like a one-time UBI. 
And honestly, that sounds like a much more beneficial situation mm -hmm. than debt forgiveness by itself. And Francesca, you had something you wanted to say earlier. I feel a little out of step with everybody. Um, I'm really admiring all of you for trying to envision the year ahead, for instance, the fu future solutions. And I'm realizing that I think for my whole life, I've always been the person that fights for the underdog, you know, who the kid that was unpopular in class, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I've um, just whatever the immediate crisis is for groups, I, I worked as a domestic violence commissioner for years and counseled groups and or thinking about people at the border who are still or actually in worse situations mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. because of this whole thing crowded together. Mm -hmm. being sent back to Mexico or wherever, you know, just kind of the immediate urgent needs of people. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a, a deep, what's the word, a defect in myself in not being able to think more future oriented, but I'm so, no, no, no. there's just this feeling that while we're talking about these possible solutions, there are people every day getting more and more desperate because they have mm -hmm. no income at all. Right, and are right. they really going to be in a place to, to sign up for grand juries or, yeah. you know, um, really entertain the mm -hmm. question of a $50,000 grant when all they're being promised is just nothing right now. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know what to do with that. It's just, well, uh, let me, let me applaud you for, um, for presencing that because there's always need for what do we do today, right this minute. But I think there's always a need too to look further down the road and say, this is what we expect to happen. How can we get to a better Absolutely. solution? So there's, it, it's a yes and. Yes, we need mm -hmm. the people like you taking care of today's needs on the border. We need people like other people that are saying, well, you know, what? how do we change this whole structure? So yes, thank you so much for presencing that. That's that's always a, an important part of of the work we do. I just wanted to um, just to to drop into the the record with the full group. Another thing that that I mentioned in our group was, um, you know, a lot of this discussion is focusing on um, debt domestically but there's the whole question yeah. of international debt and an yes. international jubilee uh to forgive you right. know what is almost all this um colonial era right ruin of of uh, yeah. of countries that were colonized so um that that needs to that should play a role also if we start really talking about jubilees mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i agree and uh, and I just have to drop in personally. Fifty thousand only covers half of my standing student debt. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I just wanted to say I'm so grateful for this conversation. I was saying in my group that mostly I just need to listen because I am so ignorant about economics. But, and I'm just learning tons from you all, and I really appreciate it. But you know, there's a reason for that. is so crucial right now, and you know a ton about that, because social psychology is how we get people uh, having the conversations that are needed. So, you know, what you just yeah. said initially about, well, we've got these immediate sort of humanitarian crises to deal with, Mm -hmm. uh, that is sane and sound, and I think reflects how most people feel. Uh, but uh, to uh, tip my hat a little bit to Derek, although this is more about public investment than debt forgiveness, right now, uh, Democrats are talking to Trump about an infrastructure bill. Um, so the, the question of sort of what we do yeah, assuming this ends uh, in a few months, <laughs> uh, what we do then is actually live in uh, Congress right now. 
So it's a good thing for people to be thinking about right now who can. And I think the reality is we need to have many conversations happening in this country at once. Mm -hmm. I would just say about also about what you said uh, that um, the people in those detention centers, mm -hmm. you know, that is a recipe uh, uh, for uh, mass death. Um, the people in the jail too uh, do mm -hmm. something about obviously yeah. mm -hmm. incarceration mm -hmm. nation. Yeah. yeah. Do we uh, do, do all the people here? I'm just curious. Do we agree that what the federal government basically has done in terms of people's lives at risk is criminal? Do we all agree with that? That most people understand that, or or do we? Do we really think right, what, that? What, I, I, what, what are you referring what to? What I'm saying is, does everyone uh, pretty or feel pretty sure that almost a, a solid majority in this country realizes what the executive branch and probably the, and obviously the Senate too are criminally liable for putting people's lives at risk? I mean, I don't remember anything quite like this at all. This is a it seems to me it's the I, I know a lot of people are certainly very aware of it. We have employers who say, no, no, we want you to come in. I talked to a friend in Wisconsin whose boss has decided that their business is essential. But these are, this is a big area of real genuine criminality, human rights criminality, and it's actually risking death. So I wonder how, how much we feel people are actually persuaded that this is the, maybe the biggest, mis, biggest, uh, problem with this administration that this country can actually put its finger on and say, this is really wrong. Or is it just that we're too, because America loves to keep people busy, too busy to think. Maybe it just comes back to the money. And Bingo. And that's the, the, the caveat I wanted to put on yeah. all of that was yeah. the reason we didn't do testing early on is the big pharma companies didn't have a kit they could sell. The WHO mm -hmm. offered to give us test kits and we said, yeah. no, we're going to let yeah. our people make them and sell them. And so the profit motive was what delayed a lot of the response. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, you get what you ask for, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm noticing the time it's 129 and I do want to try to honor our time better than we did yesterday. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> We're it, it helps it. that it's a smaller group, and I'm not complaining. I thought yesterday was fantastic, but I was a little concerned about going so far over time. Um, so let me just open a space here really quickly for, is there anything else that needs to be said? Anything you're feeling called to say? I would love it if we had a system where people could propose topics um, and we could respond. Um, maybe do a little bit of an email in advance. Mm -hmm. um, would allow us to make my concern is just I want these conversations to continue to be conversations I want them to be occasions of togetherness mm -hmm. um, that felt to me like today's meeting was sort of because I think you were also um, facilitating the meeting it was a lot of, of sort of one person talking so mm -hmm. I would want to rethink a little bit how we do it and Thanks. maybe do some emails about that. Sure. Yeah, one of the things I was imagining is, yeah, it would be wonderful. I, I, I think it's great if some of us lead, uh, lead conversations on things that, yeah, we'd like to facilitate conversations around. Um, so mm -hmm. Paul, yeah, I'd love, to, I'd love to hear from you about what, what you would like to get us discussing. Yeah, I, I will send an email to the group. I don't have all your email addresses, but Michelle does. And I think I do, an and I'm going to be I'm going to be getting I, everybody who's on this call was on yesterday, um, and that's going to go out and and share emails with everybody. Um, and Paul, I still need to get uh, Kausara's contact info from you. Oh, okay. I that. And I want to say too, we are. Um, playing with the idea of having a focus call like this one on the economy, having a focus call on a topic that is maybe once a week and separate from the daily conversations. 
and keep the daily conversations the way we've been doing them versus having a daily conversation turn into a topic discussion. And so we certainly would appreciate feedback on that too. And so that way, when you sign in, you know what you're signing in for. Yeah. Okay, but please give us feedback. Please, please give us ideas. This is a project morphing by the minute. Yep. <laughs> so. Well, thank you, Derek. Thank you all. Thank you all. And um, anything we need to do in closing, reach out, spread the word, get more people seeing us. Um, and we'd also like Let's feedback about times. So are the times working out well for you would be another thing you could give us feedback on. Not as part of this call, but just, you know, reach back to us and let us know about the times because we're starting to set the calendar for, for the next week or 10 days. And yeah. So any yeah. Feedback so feedback on timing would be good. Yeah, I just have a quick question about adding people to this group. Um, how do people feel about uh, if I were to invite two people, let's say, uh, to join yeah. us? I mean, they haven't had the advantage of the previous meetings and yeah, it also adds to the critical mass and then maybe necessitates more breakout we sessions. Want. Yeah, oh, this is want? a totally, okay. this is a completely open invite thing. This is not, not a closed group in any way shape or form yeah. and the best no, way I was to just more I, I was just more thinking in terms of our capacity to share as we get larger and larger that's I don't why have we were, a, yeah that's yeah. why we were playing the breakout, with the breakout room. rooms mm -hmm. okay can I request morning meetings as many as possible um, <laughs> just so people from Africa can take part okay mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. totally. what time would that you know, be Paul is nine okay um as long as the meetings end before noon it's okay for togo but if i were going to ask someone from uganda um, we would need to end earlier um, so yeah. if we could maybe have one that went from 9 to ten thirty, i think that'd be great yeah okay. and part of, you know, part, of what I, well, part of what i'm thinking about too is that um as more of us are leading discussions we will schedule the discussions for the times of day that are going to work best for the people that um, are interested in that topic that we're going to be discussing. Um, and yeah, and in that way, you know, it'd be great if, you know, there are three discussions happening throughout the day at different times being led by different people. Um, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's a great vision. To underline the obvious, when the email lists are out, there will be interim discussions that will strengthen what happens in these uh, Zoom meetings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can, can. That's kind of the point of trying to connect everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thanks, Kendon. All right. Very good. Cool. Okay. Spread the word. Thank you so much, everybody. I appreciate you being Thank here. You. I appreciate your participation. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.